the EPA also protects wetlands. There may be areas around water sources like streams or uh, what's it talk about? Natural ponds, marshes, swamps. And because of the three-toed flying sloth or whatever it is, there must be protected of that habitat so that they can have that like the fish and wildlife. So EPA can get involved with developers that are like, well, I'm going to buy this 800 acres. And the EPA goes, well, wait a minute, 60 of those acres are wetland. And you cannot develop on that because that wetland is necessary to maintain that ecosystem and wildlife that is around this piece of property. All right. Now we get into a fun part called USTs, underground storage tanks. Part of what I did in the or in the uh, corporate world before I got into real estate, which feels like a whole lifetime ago, I was in charge of all of our company's underground storage tanks. That was part of, believe it or not, uh, I did radiation, which fell under the environmental and I was the director of radiation exposure to a Fortune 50 company, um, feels like 100 years ago. But this actually was fell under my purview. So I have dealt a lot with these. Underground storage tanks are any tank that is buried underground. Now, it can be buried underground and be a storage tank for a many, many different purposes, like the most common one you guys think of are gas stations where the gas gets put in the ground and then you pump it out at the pump. But it's actually used a lot in commercial underground storage where we used a lot of chemicals. And to save floor space, we had our tanks buried so that somebody would come by and bring in a chemical. They would pump it into the tank and then each one of the pr presses or whatever used it would access that storage tank. Printing companies used it. Chemical plants use them. Paper mills use them. Dry cleaners are a big one. You see a lot of environmental issues with perch perchlorate. Uh, they call it perk for dry cleaners. And a lot of these companies that use them, use them underground mainly to save space because they were doing something else with the floor space. You know, that's where the factory was. So they used them. We also used them in the residential heating oils. They could have been in the basement or sometimes they were buried right outside the house and that's where the heating oil would have been stored. The problem is with technology, the way that it has changed, a lot of those tanks have become abandoned. And because they have become abandoned, they could have now rusted and all of that stuff has leaked out of there. And they call those a leaking underground storage tanks. And the cleanup was very expensive, much like the uh, uh, groundwater we talked about could flow for miles or across property lines. You will see that with leaking underground storage tank. So a property that might be situated right next to a gas station may have an environmental issue that was actually caused by the leaking underground storage tank over here. But when it got into the ground and it migrated, and they call that a plume, uh, if you think about like an air plume, uh, that liquid or whatever it was, most of the time gas is what we're getting ready to talk about, gasoline, would have plumed into another property. And now that property owner may actually have an environmental issue because their neighbor had a leaking underground storage tank. So what happened was EPA came up with some rules about underground storage tanks and it required certain things. Now, there were actually exemptions, and it said if there was at least 10% underground that of that tank, then it's considered underground. And they were, all of the owners of this underground storage tanks 
were required to adhere to these laws. And these laws covered the installation, the maintenance, the corrosion, the record keeping, monitoring, how often. And this is what I kind of did in my department. Now, I had other guys that actually physically did the maintenance and the monitoring and all of that. But it was required so that we could track and make sure there was no leak coming from these underground storage tanks. Well, they got really um, inundated and realized that there were so many of these that they actually put in exemptions. So if your leak or if your underground storage tank contained less than 110 gallons, they really weren't worried about it. If it was used for non-commercial use, like on the farm. So if a farmer had gasoline stored and that's where he used to fuel all of his farm equipment, that would be exempted from any of these rules. The most common one you and I will see are the old farmhouses that have heating oil tanks buried outside or any of the tanks in the basement, as long as that tank was sitting on a floor. So like in the basement of the house, these are where you and I are going to see underground storage tanks. But understand, they are exempted from these rules. And then anything else that might not have been hazardous, like septic tanks or rainwater tanks. There were a, a lot of the old farmhouses would collect rainwater and they would use that uh, on the farm. So those tanks were exempted, okay? When it dealt with these things called a brownfield. Now I gotta give you a little bit of a background and let's jump down to here. A brownfield is an old abandoned site, usually commercial or industrial, that may have used hazardous chemicals on site, but because the company is either shut down or went defunct or moved, there are still potential hazards on that property that would be considered what they call a brownfield. And they passed the laws in 2002 to clean those up. And that is called the brownfield laws. And they dealt with the federal and local laws that also covered this next topic here called landfills. A landfill is nothing more than a hole in the ground in which you stuff stuff. That so what happens is they would build a hole in the ground and this is going to be for a landfill. And then they would line this hole and they could line that hole with clay because clay is impervious to leaking. Or sometimes you may actually see them. They may have potentially put some kind of polyurethane liner on that. And then they would fill it up with all of the stuff that went in that landfill. And then what they did was they cap it. That is called a cap or capping. And then they would have grass over it. And then guess what they do with it, right? Put a golf course on it because they couldn't use that for putting houses on because there's stuff under it. So a lot of times you will see golf courses. I'm being 100% honest. Parks, dog parks, places where the grass is being used as grass, all right? Can't build on it because it, the this crap in here would not hold the structure, but it certainly would hold a golf course or a park or uh, a dog park. There are a lot of golf courses, and I can name two within 50 miles of where I'm sitting at this current moment that are golf courses on top of closed landfills. Now, closed meaning that they have closed that, that section up. It's not a derelict or abandoned landfill. They're just now in another area filling holes in. They have closed these out, so therefore everything's fine and dandy, and they have built golf courses.
that are those are called landfills and they cap or capping and they will do that and then like I said plant grass or vegetation over it sometimes they will actually vent this out and it will off gas any of the methane that comes from the decomposition they can use that methane believe it or not to create a fire which heats the water, which spins the turbine, which creates electricity. That's supposed to be a flame. Sorry. There is a very big, uh, it's actually a golf course as well, called Twin Bridges out in the western side of Indiana that is owned by Waste Management. They actually create their own electricity and run their whole facility off of the electric they are making through this type of system. And it actually has a pretty good golf course, okay? So that is the waste uh, landfills. Then what happened with these brownfields? So here's what happened. And this actually was the main portion of my job dealing with the legislation of this. Those brownfields were, because they were abandoned, had to be cleaned up. So the government created this thing called CERCLA. That is the acronym, which stands for the Comprehensive Environmental Response and Compensation and Liability Act, CERCLA. It was such a big number when it was created in 1980, they actually called it Superfund. It was only like $8 billion. And I say that now in today's world because there are probably 3,000 people in the United States that are worth more than that. But at that time, it was such a big number that they called it, the nickname was called Superfund. That's important for le later legislation. And when they created uh, CERCLA, they did it and said, okay, look, we'll clean this up, but we are actually going to try and recover our money from these perps, these potentially responsible parties, PRP. So they are going to go after that derelict company that left all of that stuff around that the government cleaned up. It was administered by the EPA. Now, here's the issue. <clears throat> it's very easy to win any game in the world or any sport in the world if you get to change the rules when you're at that <laughs> or it's your turn. And that's what CERCLA did. They changed the rules. <clears throat> when they decided to go after these perps, they said, okay, we will go after these people, but we are going to change the definition of who is liable, who are potentially responsible parties. Well, they changed the definition and they created three types of liabilities. Strict liability. Strict liability says, if you owned it, you completed the mess. We don't care. Strict. Everybody that owned it created it. And because of that, we can sue jointly or severally, meaning we can sue one of you, that would be several, like severalty, right? Separate them out. We're going to sue one of you, or we may sue all of you jointly. But the real big kick in the ding ding was they created this thing called retroactive, which means if you've ever owned that property, backwards retro. So what they said was all of these PRPs who are liable we are going to try and sue and get our money back. Well, liable means if you owned it, you did it. We are going to sue one of you or all of you. And if you've ever owned it, 
I don't care if you owned it for 12 minutes in 1946. You are now on our radar as a potentially responsible property or <coughs> potentially responsible party. So you see how they now have changed the definition of the word liable to include virtually everybody. Everybody, if you owned it, if you ever owned it, you did it, and you could be named in that lawsuit. So the problem was, 